improve the way that we address these types of properties. Um, we had some, what we thought were some really great successes in terms of um, cleaning up a number of problem properties, again, in various different parts of the municipality, from Shindiac to the hillside to Pinar and Mountain View, Midtown. Um, and we also identified what our persistent enforcement problems are, the things that we're always running up against with these properties came down to basically three categories. One, why haven't you taken action yet? This has been a problem for a really long time, and uh, why aren't you, why isn't the municipality doing anything? Another, a lack of consistent funds, kind of hangs together with the first one in many, many ways. Um, and then the third was a lack of accountability during the foreclosure process. Our code enforcement crew has told us that they, that they frequently see properties um, where a foreclosure proceeding has commenced, and so the landowner no longer feels accountable for the property because they know they are likely losing it. They haven't paid the bills on it for some time. And yet the bank has not yet taken ownership, which means the bank is not yet accountable, and so we have a loophole. There was some press coverage about this in the fall of 2018. This is a, uh, a property in Mountain View, I believe it's on North Button Street, um, and a, uh, a multiplex that uh, was in foreclosure and was a persistent a key example of a vacant property that was in the foreclosure process, not yet foreclosed upon, and where we went back and forth with the out-of-state bank for months trying to get them to uh, send in these contractors who are there in the picture to make sure that the boarding stayed in place, to make sure that people were expelled from the property, to make sure that compliance was achieved with our vacant and abandoned properties ordinance. Um, in a, so we proposed AO 2019-9, which is the ordinance that was passed by this body in February. It did a few different things. It created a foreclosure registry, which held banks accountable by creating this foreclosure registry, um, uh, and then expanding accountability for code compliance. So the foreclosure registry says that banks will be held, held um, accountable as if they were owners during the pendency of the process. The key thing that does is our vacant and abandoned properties ordinance, which uh, we've heard complaints that they're redundant, they aren't, because the vacant and abandoned properties ordinance only applies to owners. So while a bank is not, um, is not, is not in ownership of the property, the, um, uh, the, uh, it is not swept into the vacant and abandoned properties ordinance. And so the, again, we have this window of non-accountability. 2019-9 also created a dedicated financial resource. Um, it created a dedicated use of property abatement fund and self-replenishing with revenues from annual fees and foreclosure proceedings. And it increased some common nuisance property fees and fines um, and created this exponential increase in vacant property registration fees over time to try and create an incentive for action on these properties instead of to occupy them or sell them, basically. It, we don't have a shortage of people interested in, in building housing in Anchorage, uh, and so a lot of these properties, and you know, we have a number of them that are key that we hear a lot about are in airport heights where people really want to build. And so we'd rather have them be turned over, resold, try to create a financial incentive for that to happen. Specifically, the foreclosure registry, which is what this ordinance addresses, um, it's a common solution across the country. There are 284 municipalities that have adopted these since 2000, since the mortgage crisis. Um, a lot of it fueled by the mortgage crisis having uh, increased the number of uh, properties in foreclosure across the country. Um, and generally, so we modeled our language. Our language didn't pull it out of thin air. We modeled it on a number of other uh, jurisdictions across the country that basically require banks to notify the jurisdiction uh, when foreclosure proceedings are pending and to provide direct local contact information so we don't have to go hunting through layers of folks uh, often out of state in order to find the person who is accountable for this property that we know is in foreclosures. We don't have to hunt and figure that out either when the property becomes a problem. Um, and again, there's this piece where that we added in where the banks are expressly treated as an owner of the property for the purpose of code obligations. Also not something that is uncommon outside of Anchorage. Um, and again, what we're dealing with, uh, this is a picture of the inside of that North Bud Street property. You can actually see the boards that are supposed to be on the windows that were pulled down in this picture. So um, this is a property where, again, uh, it's, it, was, it's, it was at this point in the foreclosure process and um, is supposed to be, and is also vacant, it's supposed to be uh, 
um, boarded and secured, and it was persistently broken into. And again, the problem code enforcement dealt with was getting the bank to continue to send contractors back, which they eventually did, to put those boards back up. This is another example. This is a property in Bernard, where again, you can see the boards on the windows. Um, but because it is it's, uh, both in foreclosure and it is abandoned, um, and it became this type of nuisance property during its period while it was vacant and while it was still in foreclosure. Again, working with the out of state bank, eventually a couple months later, they were able to get the bank to come and haul off some of this stuff and put the boards back up. But these are just a few examples of what we're, what we're dealing with. By no means does every property which falls into foreclosure end up like this, but this is a loophole that code enforcement was seeing repeatedly in different properties across the, the municipality. And this is a common solution that other municipalities have enacted um, in order to deal with this problem. So what, what was enacted uh, is, is section 1505-170, the foreclosure registry, what does it include? Again, it includes uh, the requirement to, um, within 30 days of filing uh, or recording a uh, complaint or action of foreclosure or notice of default, um, a deeded mortgage or deed of trust lender is required to file notice with the municipality. That includes the name of the lender, the description of the property, and then importantly, um, the full name and contact information, including direct telephone number and email address for a representative of the lender. If the lender is outside of Alaska, uh, the requirement is to provide somebody in the state who's going to be accountable for care, maintenance, security, and upkeep. Again, so we have somebody we can call if the property um, becomes an issue. Um, and then there is a, uh, we, we also have to have an authorized person who can accept service on behalf of the lender. So if we have to end up taking legal steps with respect to the property. It's a $200 per property filing fee, one-time fee designed to offset the expense to the real estate department. <coughs> And then there is this duty to maintain during the foreclosure process. So where did this ordinance come from? This ordinance came from some discussions after this was adopted with uh, some of the representatives of the lender community who are in the audience today and some others as well. Um, we heard a couple of different concerns. We heard the ordinance is not clear on how to remove a property from the registry. We heard the ordinance may hold lenders responsible for things they can't legally do. If they don't legally have the right to go on the property, they can't board it up. So are we fighting them for something they can't actually do? Um, we heard that the registration requirement is cumbersome and occurs too quickly after the date that a filing is made um, because sometimes people redeem properties and come off the list. We heard that the registration fee is too high um, we heard that the municipality already has a vacant demand of properties registry and does not need both. Um, so this ordinance really doesn't address all these things. So I'm going to talk about what it does address, and then I'm going to talk about why the administration staff elected not to make the other changes. I'm sure you'll hear more about that perspective today, um, and then I'm happy to answer any questions. So the things that this ordinance does are basically the top two. We, uh, we said you're right, there is nothing on here that says clearly how you get the property off the registry. We should correct that, make sure that um, it's clear how a property comes off. And we also wanted to make um, additionally clear that we wouldn't, certainly wouldn't hold uh, lenders responsible for things that they legally were unable to do. Um, we did not elect to include these three um, pieces in, uh, in this revision ordinance, and again, I'll speak to that more specifically. Uh, in a moment of why we did that. So again, specifically, what does the ordinance do? This is the language of 2019-101. It includes, it adds a caveat that says, except as limited by applicable state and federal law, um, in, in terms of the lender's liability as an owner. And I think that we were, we, were let, we were told that this could manifest in various different ways. So we added this caveat to allow lenders to come and say, look, you just, uh, you're trying to hold the liable again for boarding up windows of a vacant property. We are not allowed on the property. We cannot do that. And then we say, okay, fine. We, I agree. So that is sort of a generalized caveat to account for that specific situation and other situations in which um, there may be things that a, an owner could do where a lender who's not yet in possession does not have the ability to do that. Um, the second, again, we added a, a, a section about removal from the registry. Uh, saying so they'll write, write, write a, a request in writing to the real estate department, support by documentary evidence demonstrating that the foreclosure proceeding has ceased, and then we're done. Um, and in terms of the, the things we didn't adopt, um, so the first question about the, requ the requirement is cumbersome and the timeline is too short. 
Uh, in terms of the timeline, we looked at a number of comparable jurisdictions, and we actually think our timeline is relatively long. We started, actually, if you remember in the process, those of you who were there, we started proposing a 10-day window to register because that looked like more like the, the windows we'd seen. And I think we took, a, the original language we took came from the East Coast jurisdiction, I think a New Jersey jurisdiction, and they had a 10-day uh, uh, window as well. And in the process of this body adopting the ordinance, we moved that to 30 days out of the concern that 10 days was too short. So now we're at 30, which based on a lot of the jurisdictions we've looked at is on the longer end. Um, and again, I, I think it's a balancing act. I think that what we heard from lenders was oftentimes people, with, if you gave us 180 days, then we would get most of these people, they wouldn't even have to be on the list. And I think the challenge we heard from our code enforcement teams is in that 180 days, that's when we have the problem. We have six months when we don't know who's in charge. And so um, either, the, either we ask the banks to do the work of telling us or we require the real estate department to spend a bunch of their time hunting for this information. So Tiffany and the real estate department ends up looking at title and trying to figure out if something's been filed and then chasing down a bank and trying to figure out who to call. And if we instead put, um, move that responsibility to the bank uh, conducting the foreclosure in that 30 days, then we have that information right away. Um, this is the foreclosure property registration form, so you know what's being required to be filed. This is the sum total of the information that has to come in in that 30 days. It's basically what's the property, um, who is your local contact person? When was it last inspected? Is it occupied or not? Are the utilities on or off? Um, who's the mortgagee? Uh, and then who's submitting it? So while it does require some information, uh, you know, look like a little bit of digging, when was it last inspected? Is it occupied or not? Are the utilities on or off? Um, we don't think that it's so cumbersome uh, that it is to be prohibitive. And again, I think we've modeled this on other jurisdictions and this is valuable information that either we ask the banks to provide to us or we require the real estate department to try and dig up on their own if we're going to do anything about the properties that do become these issues. With respect to the registration fee, again, we looked at other jurisdictions. This is the same list of jurisdictions that I just showed you uh, for the, for the um, timeline. And here we're on the low end. Um, and this was actually added in in the process of, of workshopping this ordinance as well. I think we initially didn't have a fee, and then Mr. Traney said, wait a minute, isn't is this gonna cost the municipality something? And he said, well, yes, it's gonna cost something to the real estate department, and he requested that we add in a fee. We added in $200 because that does add some um, cushion to the real estate department's budget where they're doing this addition, they're doing the work of administering this, um, this new uh, process. And $200 is, again, at the very low end of what a number of other jurisdictions are charging for, um, for uh, this type of registry. We asked the real estate department to estimate, oh, you can't really see that, that's terrible. Um, that red writing at the bottom of the screen, I apologize, in the future I will use white. It says real estate department costs $326 to $489 per week. 16,952 to $25,428 per year. That's an estimate of the time Tiffany is spending. And it's a little bit of, I see this in public space, and it, it is legitimately, I mean, Tiffany is already, it's not like we've hired a new employee to do this. This is the amount of time she's diverting to this that she would otherwise be doing other things. Um, you know, would she be spending that time on researching uh, abandoned, you know, who owns that in abandoned properties, I don't know, I'm not sure. So it's a little bit of a, uh, of a there's a little bit of, of kind of a, um, of, I don't know what to say. I guess it's it's not as though we are now spending an additional, like we're contracting out for this labor, but this is an estimate of how much of Tiffany's time is going to deal with this. Another question we heard frequently is the registries are redundant. You have a vacant and abandoned properties registry. It already does this. Why do you need a foreclosure registry? Again, you're asking the same people for more money. And I think and our response to that is they're actually very different. <coughs> the foreclosure registry captures lender information within 30 days of a foreclosure action, whether or not a property is occupied or not. It captures the lender information. It gives us a local contact person for that lender uh, for the property during um, during the pendency of the foreclosure action. It extends liability for compliance with the vacant abandoned registry and other code to lenders. So it's not just the owner. Now we have this accountability for the lender during that gap. 
Um, and it also has it charges a one-time fee, which is designed to offset the real cost of administration to the real estate department. Vacant and abandoned property, by contrast, it captures owner information within 180 days of a property becoming vacant. So that registry asks for the owner of a vacant and abandoned property, not the lender. Lender is not swept into vacant and abandoned properties to provide information uh, to, to tell us that their property is vacant within 180 days of that happening. Um, but for the foreclosure registry, that, make, that registry does not apply to lenders. So we don't know, uh, again, we don't have lender liability there. Uh, and it requires that properties be signed, secured, and maintained, and it can, includes this escalating annual fee uh, to incentivize reoccupancy or sale. And the idea there is not so much, again, that fee is not designed to offset uh, the real cost of administration. It's sort of a proxy for the fact that um, these fees, off, that these properties often become more problematic to the municipality over time. And so uh, the amount of money, I don't think it even closely approximates the amount of police time and fire time and code enforcement time we're spending on properties that are vacant for a period of 10 or 15 years. Um, but it's designed to, again, to roughly approximate that and also to incentivize reoccupancy or sale for these persistent vacant properties. Different purpose, different tools. Do they, might they apply to some of the same properties? Certainly but they do very different things and they also apply to it. In the Venn diagram of their application, there is overlap, but there, is also, there are also significant properties that are covered only by one or by the other. So that, I'm happy to take questions um, or however we'd like to proceed. Thank you. Um, so just want to note for the record that uh, we were joined by Mr. Weddleton and Ms. LaFrance about 15, 20 minutes ago. Um, I, let's start with Ms. Elita. Um, thank you. Um, so you actually raised a good question. Um, who's in charge? And I think, you know, when we add this except is limited by applicable state and federal law, do we know how the courts generally treat property during a foreclosure procedure proceeding if it's currently occupied? because what that form doesn't really get to is who's ultimately in charge. And so if the bank knows that this house, the people intend to remain unless they are ordered out and the courts treat that as they're the ones in charge, how can we designate that? Because if that's what we're trying to find out, I, I'm just trying to reconcile that. Because that, that's what I'm hearing, I think, from some of the uh, comments is that we can't do anything with regard to this property because we're really not in charge yet. We may have filed the foreclosure action, but it still rests with yeah. the owner. And I think practically speaking, how that would work is <clears throat> we have this information now, we have the filing that says, okay, there's been a foreclosure uh, filed, the real estate department has that, and it has the contact information for the bank. And then something happens on the property that is a nuisance. Um, whether it is a stockpile of stuff, as you've seen pictured, or we uh, we know it's vacant and it's boarded up and all the boards are down and there's a bunch of people in there using drugs. And then what happens is code enforcement goes out, or you know, practically speaking, someone calls code enforcement, code enforcement goes out, looks at it, says, oh my gosh, it really is a problem. We gotta contact the owner and give them our warning, and then we start letting these. And that's where I think we have an interaction with the lender because the lender is now also on the hook and we have their contact information in real estate. And then we query them about where they are in the process. And I think that we put the onus on them to say, uh, you know what, we don't actually, we're not, we're in the process of obtaining possession of that property, but we're not yet in possession. Or we still have those that is still <coughs> occupied. The person, there is still a person in there who we can't force out because they're the, uh, they are the owner of the property and they give us that information and then code enforcement, that's a defense to the code enforcement uh, attempt to levy fines. If code enforcement isn't convinced, then we have a series, there's a, there's a process built on the code about whether or not if you want to appeal something that's being posed upon you by code enforcement, it goes to the, um, the uh, administrative hearing officer and then from the AHO goes on to superior court. So I think what we what we practically speaking envision happening is again this interaction at the front at the front end as soon as code enforcement goes out there and they know who to call they call the bank and they go back and forth and talk about whether this fits in the exception in the code or not and then if there's a disagreement about whether or not it fits in that exception there's a process of appeal and it goes again to the AHO and the Superior Court so the parties can work it out. So I mean so if I just understand correctly we're going to put the onus on the lender to say. Um, we have this property, it's in foreclosure. 
here's our information. If they're contacted ultimately by code enforcement, say, whoa, we can't do anything, we don't have possession, we, we can't do, um, we're not the owner yet, um, subject to, because of state or federal law or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so it'll just be a defense to the code enforcement issue and the, the issue will just remain or then we'll go and we would go and try to contact the property owner to, to resolve the that. And do I that. mean, in all of these situations, we envision first contacting the property owner. If the property owner is still living there and is intending to redeem the property, they, I mean, they, I think that's a very different, that's one end of the spectrum is the mm -hmm. property owner who's still actively involved in their property and is still answering the phone and is Go, is still invested in their property. The end of the spectrum that we are dealing with, the, the problem end is the person who is just either completely checked out or is physically out of the property, and then we have a long gap while the process is proceeding. So I think in that situation, again, that's where we have a dialogue. We say, you're right, there's somebody in there. We'll call them, we'll talk to them, and we will pursue them at this point. One last one. Um, and then where the, on the other end where the property is vacant, then that property would actually be foreclosure registry and vacant property registry if we know the folks are gone and they've been gone for the requisite period of time. As long as we've gotten to the 180 day period, <coughs> the foreclosure registry does give us somebody who we, who we can contact as the owner who we direct right away. Um, and uh, at 100, when it's been vacant for 180 days, then it would go on to the vacant abandoned property registry as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dixon. <clears throat> yeah, I have a similar question that, that I hope clarifies things. <clears throat> so, on a piece of property like these, if somebody got hurt and wanted to sue the owner for you know, an unsafe condition, how do you know how the courts have handled that? I, so, if it, are you assuming it's vacant? Yes. And you're assuming it's in foreclosure? Yes. And you're assuming the lender has possession or does not have possession? It's in that process somewhere. So well, somebody gets hurt because of a hazard on the property. Who does those? What have the court said about who gets to pay? Okay. Or I think the, the short defender. answer is I don't know exactly what the courts have said about that specific scenario. If there is a property that is in foreclosure and someone is injured, uh, who gets to pay. I yeah. think based on general generalized principles of tort law, I think it would depend on who is accountable and what the source of the injury was, what the approximate cause of the injury was. So if the bank was boarding up the windows and somehow negligently boarded them and the person was impaled by the negligently oh, no, put up yeah. nails, then I think the approximate cause there is the bank, the action of the contractor who's working for the bank. I mean, I think it's, it's hard for me to answer that yeah. specifically without the facts of what the source of the injury is and who was accountable for the thing that injured the person. Does that make sense? That's how it's Yeah, so I asked the question again artfully, and uh, I'll try to do better if I can think of how okay. to do it. But it's, <laughs> it, it, we're, we're trying to figure out our, who's responsible, mm -hmm. you know. So I was trying to get at if it's not uh, what we're after here, but a liability issue, what has been the process? And it, I was thinking, well, okay, if it's the, whoever owns the land is responsible, mm -hmm. you know, uh, how does that get determined when it's in that process, mm -hmm. somewhere between abandoned and, and for, co close, the end of the foreclosure? Probably not, yeah, so anyways. Thanks for trying. Yeah, I mean, I think there's, I think the challenge is there's a lot of pieces moving, right? If yeah. the property is vacant and the person is a trespasser, the law treats that person differently than they treat a person who's invited onto the property by the person who owns the land. Yeah. And so there's enormous number of nuances, like did the person break into the property and it, it creates a very different <coughs> liability situation than a person who, again, is an invitee who you invite over to your unsafe property. So it's there's a lot of different fact-specific pieces. And, and just be a nag. It would be helpful if you spoke a little more slowly. slowly. I know, I apologize. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Ms. Kennedy. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm tracking with Mr. Dyson on that in terms of uh, liability questions because it seems like if we're requiring more, um, then we must be, we're going to end up assuming some more liability as well. Um, so it is interesting that. Um, that we're kind of making ourselves to a certain extent we're expanding our partnership in this whole um, issue 
uh, by requiring a registry and then actually and taking a fee for it as well. Um, but I, I think I want to kind of go back to the responsibility part of it too. And it seems to me that we're asking the real estate department to do the registry, maybe the data input um, for that particular um, uh, request of the, of the loaners. Um, but we're actually asking code enforcement to really do the operational side of things. So why is this in the realm of real estate versus the realm of code enforcement? Yeah, thank you. So, uh, Mr. Chair, the uh, foreclosure registry specifically is allocated to the real estate department because of that research and registration component that they perform. Any code enforcement or code abatement work <coughs> is funded through a different source. And if, if you recall, and I apologize, I don't remember if you were on the body yet or not, but when the original uh, ordinance passed creating this, it also created a nuisance property fund. And that nuisance property fund is uh, funded by all of the uh, other actions that the real estate and code enforcement officers take on nuisance property. So if we, for example, uh, levy uh, fines due to nuisance property, so those fines all go into this, into this pot. Code enforcement actions uh, taken on property can be funded from that, whether it's code enforcement, our contractors, our maintenance and operations crew, et cetera. So they're, they're, we look at those two separate functions of, of alleviating these nuisance problems, these nuisances, but uh, there's two different funding sources too. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Whittleton. Thanks. Um, talking about this $200 fee, you kind of started out, I was a little bit late, but still noticed. Um, talking about what the problems are and how you're we're, as a city having trouble dealing with the abandoned properties and so on. Code enforcement has to go there, police and so on. So the solution is, oh, we can make this better if we get some more information from the lenders. And actually, what we're doing is we're cutting our costs. It seems like we're making it easier on so it's like the $200 to cover our increased costs are actually decreasing our costs. I mean, it might be code enforcement's costs as opposed to some of the real estate or something. So I mean, the $200 fee, you know, goes directly to someone who's struggling. They can't buy their house. Mm -hmm. you know, they can't pay for their house. You know, they're going to end up sleeping in our woods. Um, and we're saying, and kick them while they're down. You know, we already have the $100, and I know it kicks in after six months and may not get it, but we're saving money by this. So it does seem like Knock them too often, just have two zeros. I think, um, I think a couple things. I mean, I think that part of the challenge is different departments that are handling this. Like, it's not is code enforcement versus real estate. Um, and uh, I also think, I mean, I, like from where I sit, maybe the folks in the audience can tell us more about this. But I don't think that the fact that we're levying a fee necessarily means the fee has to be passed on to the um, to the homeowner themselves. Uh, maybe it does, and so they can maybe explain that to us. Uh, but it, I, I, it, I think that there's, that there's a second step in that process, too. Also, this is, as you uh, correctly pointed out, this is a preventative measure. This is like going to see your doctor annually to make sure that you don't contract some uh, uh, health issue that costs more money down the road. That, that's been the example that other communities uh, have provided us and why we follow this road. A little bit of effort on the front end actually saves a lot of resources on the back end. Every one of your neighborhoods that you represent have had problem properties in the short time that we've been here that we've had to spend an inordinate amount of money on. Uh, just today, for example, we finally uh, completed a $60,000 teardown of the Zabo property, uh, a, a massive nuisance property that will come nowhere close to recouping probably all of the costs in time and resources we've spent on it. So, uh, providing this kind of information up front, and it does have a fee attached to it, but it goes a long way in alleviating what has a greater potential of becoming a long-term problem that costs way more than the Thank you. Ms. Elton? Thank you. Um, to follow up on that last point, is the intent here then to, by having the lenders register that once they get the foreclosed property, this, I guess this is where I'm having a bit of a cognitive disconnect. So once they, the foreclosure proceeding is done and there isn't any state or law, bar, federal law barrier to them being the owners of the property, technically the property can come off the foreclosure registry. And, the then, and that could happen within 
a shorter period than the 180 days till it's considered a vacant property. So we still have a gap, right? Um, am I understanding correctly? I mean, they become the property owners of record, the bank does at that point, but we still have a gap to where it's kind of being monitored. Um, well, I guess sort of yes and no. Um, I think the issue that we've had so far is that uh, we haven't been able to hold the, the banks accountable for anything, and we don't know who they are, and we don't have anyone to contact during the foreclosure proceeding. Once the foreclosure is concluded and ownership passes to the bank, then we at least have them, they're on the hook as an owner, they're, they're, that title transfer is recorded, we know exactly who owns the property, we can find that easily in the property record, and then um, we are able to, then the, we're able to levy fines for as soon as the property is messy, or you know, or if it's getting excessive police calls, all of that goes to the owner directly, 880, so we have other mechanisms for um, enforcing the various manifestations of the type of sort of neglect or um, problematic behaviors that might be happening in the property. Um, and I also think that the way, to my mind, the way that Title 15 counts the vacant and abandoned properties, I think it would run concurrently. So if something has been vacant for uh, three months before foreclosure and then it remains vacant for, it would be another three months until it would go on the vacant and abandoned registry. So the change of ownership would change the timeline there? I don't think they were to call any part of Title 15 which resets based on change of ownership, it just resets based on the time period that it has been vacant. Uh, may I ask one more? Well, thank you. Um, and is the idea here, are we having someone monitor foreclosure filings or is this all self-reported by the lenders? And is there a fine or a penalty if you don't report and we later find out that it was a foreclosed property? Uh, there is a fine that was built into the original ordinance um, and there uh, it is self-reported by the lender. At this point, uh, the real estate is doing a little bit of uh, monitoring to see how, whether or not people are complying just to have a general sense and I think that uh, real estate will start eventually sending out notices of non-compliance and then eventually levying fines if people don't come into compliance, they also make give everyone notice first before any fines are levied, um, just so people start getting in the rhythm of complying. Um, uh, and hopefully over time, it will become more a second nature for lenders operating in the Anchorage market. Thank you. <coughs> Ms. LaFrance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, as I came in late, I may have <coughs> missed this part, but Ms. Kennedy mentioned something about the city taking on more liability with the fee, um, with charging a fee, and uh, could you address that piece? Sure, that and, uh, and through the chair, I, I don't see any additional addition in liability through the foreclosure registry, maybe you just can clarify if there's something I'm missing in that we, we are certainly taking on more information, and mm -hmm. we will now have, because, and that's really what we're trying to get, we're trying to get more information so that we have, so the code enforcement, so Jack's team has someone else to call when they're dealing with a property that is in foreclosure where the actual, where it first goes to the owner and the owner may be non-responsive or not present, that mm -hmm. um, they then have that information. But I don't think it gives us any additional liability. Uh, it just gives us additional information to another person who's on the hook for a property that might be a problem in the community. But if I'm missing your question, please. Well, I mean, that, um, do you mind? Um, that really was my question was, is this because we are now we're asking them a fee we want to require people so there must be some kind of rationale behind doing that and if we are demanding that of people or requiring of that then what level of responsibility or liability does that give us because it's almost like to a certain extent we're taking on some ownership in some of this and that would that would be my question is yeah. if we're if we're demanding this, requiring this of people, then what is the relationship of our with our liability or liability on it? So yeah, so, I mean, there, I, there's no legal addition addition to our ownership over any of these properties. All, all we're asking for is information so that our code enforcement team has someone else to go to when they're dealing with properties that are in the foreclosure process and that. Um, and uh, where there were problems that developed, where code compliance issues have developed. So we don't, by, by virtue of having this information, have any additional responsibility for these properties over and above the sort of police power responsibility we already have to try and enforce code violations. We just now have someone else that we can go to and say, your property has become a problem, who's, who's going to make it better? 
Yeah. Just to add to that, <coughs> uh, this topic is was covered in the original ordinance, and so it's in code currently about how to treat uh, during in the foreclosure process, how to treat lenders as the owner of the property. Um, and, and specifically, it calls on the owners, uh, the lenders, I'm sorry, to be considered as the owner of the subject property for purposes of obligations, enforcement actions, and penalties. So uh, the idea of us assuming responsibility because we have a registry, I don't know, I mean, you heard Becky's answer on the legal aspect, but I think uh, functionally, it, we're not assuming any ownership or any responsibility for it at that point other than monitoring. I, I can put you back in the queue. Did you have anything else, Mr. Prince? Uh, no, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Mr. Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And so we're not talking about properties that the Muni is foreclosing on because of back taxes or something. These are privately held properties, right? That's what For the record, yes, we are nodding. <laughs> just, wanted, just, just wanted to clarify. Not going on over here, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy. Um, kind of along the same lines, I guess. Um, this is really about all foreclosures, regardless of the reason that a bank is foreclosing on something and whether or not it's ever going to be a nuisance property. You want this information for all properties, even though kind of the rationale behind it is to make sure you have somebody to go to in case it turns into a nuisance property. Is that, um, is that fair to say that so it's fair, yes, all for all properties, not all foreclosed properties will become nuisances, but in the experience of our code enforcement department, this is a significant loophole where we have persistent problem poverty is where this information would be key. Okay. Um, May I continue? Yeah. Um, so I guess my next question, and, and I don't know if you would really have an answer for this one, and not, it might be for some of the people who are, are here um, to uh, testify, but um, do we have a sense of how this will impact those people whose homes are going to be foreclosed due to earthquake damage? They're unlivable. We certainly have a number of them. Um, they probably will walk away. Um, so anyway, um, is that going to impact that kind of a foreclosure as well. So, sure, we did talk about this when this was adopted. I'm trying to remember from my lose from my brain what we said. I think the I think the issue there was yes, if someone's walking away from their property, um, the bank who is uh, foreclosing on the property would have to register. And I think that that uh, it shouldn't impact if the person is literally walking away from their property. They should they should face no adverse impacts from this. Um, and those are probably properties we want to deal with because someone has walked away, the property is potentially unsafe, and it is now unoccupied. And so those are properties that are really prone to become nuisance properties in the community. Like if someone actually is walking away from the property and is no longer there, um, that's where those are the properties where we really actually see this issue happening where people want to do drug deals in those houses or et cetera. Um, but there shouldn't be a different or more adverse impact on the individuals who are leaving their properties behind <coughs> because of this ordinance. Thank you. Mr. Williams. Well, I just, um, the conversation is good. Um, I didn't support this when we first did it, but now we have something that just, I mean, what's in front of us, so I think is improvements to, to what we did. So I think some of these questions, it's almost like, they're valid, we're going to go back and pull the whole ordinance, but speaking of what's in front of us, you know, it fixes some holes. So we have some speakers here. If you want to speak against the whole section of code, we're not really dealing with that at this point, but just these additions. Um, I'd like to hear from people who are here, but focus on the changes, be really better or worse, if we make the whole thing better. Is that, is that correct, summary? Yeah, I think that's, that's fair. Uh, so before we turn to the audience, are there any other questions for administration. Okay, so if anyone wants to speak in the audience, if you could just reintroduce yourself for the record, and then uh, you can speak to the ordinance before us. So, if it, may, if it pleases the chair, so my name is Michael Martin, and I am the Chief Operating Officer and General Counsel for North Green Bank. I'm also the Vice President for uh, the Alaska Bankers Association. So. Uh, be clear, uh, we were unaware of this ordinance, perhaps we should have been, uh, when it first uh, passed in February, uh, we became aware of it after the fact, and had an opportunity to read it, and had quite a few concerns about it, um, and so I will limit 
my conversation here today to simply this ordinance that's before you. Um, but before I do that, I would like to just, because uh, I can't help myself as a banker, uh, you know, I think language does matter. Um, the language that's been used here today uh, by many of you is you keep referring to the bank as opposed to the lender. And I would submit to you that the problems with uh, abandoned properties, vacant properties, um, are not the, the cause uh, by banks. And particularly the local banks, uh, the banks uh, within uh, the state of Alaska, and very particularly since this is the municipality, uh, banks that are housed within the city itself. So uh, I would think uh, the word lender is a good choice of, of words for uh, the, the um, for the uh, ordinance, and so I'll just sort of remind you that in connection with properties that we have, uh, you know, that is the collateral that we have for loans, uh, for which we are not being paid, and so there's a duty on behalf of our borrowers, who are the true owners of the property, to maintain their property, and of course. Uh, when they don't do that for whatever reason, and we go through a foreclosure process, uh, you know, we are trying as best we can to preserve our collateral to the greatest extent that we can, uh, as, as law allows us to do. But we can't obviously go on to property if we're not an owner or if we have no rights. And one of the reasons uh, we wouldn't do that, of course, which was raised here today, is that we create liability issues for the bank, not only from a liability, from a negligence standpoint, but also through the process uh, of foreclosure itself. So I guess what I would say is that um, the ordinance that's proposed here today, um, I think is a step in the right direction. However, I would comment that specifically, if you look at the language uh, that's being proposed uh, in the first section, it says a lender shall be considered an owner of the subject property except as limited by uh, applicable state and federal law for the purpose of obligations, enforcements, actions, and penalties. And so I guess what I would say is that um, obviously if we're not the owners of the property. Uh, we have no ability to go in and do boarding ups and, and things like that. But yet we're still responsible. The law would not allow us to do that. But we're still we're still responsible for, uh, for <coughs> penalties and obligations, and, and I appreciate the, the comment that you made that it's part of the process that there would be communication with the lender. But the language that, that is proposed doesn't doesn't limit that, right? It doesn't say that. It simply says that uh, for purposes of being an owner uh, under state law, that we wouldn't be responsible for obligations, which I assume is going on in boarding up properties. And, like that, so um, I guess you know the idea that you wouldn't necessarily know who the lender is because perhaps the promissory note has been sold, and so you know there might be additional uh, orders and there might be additional lenders and all that sort of stuff. The the, the concept of having a registry, I, I see value in that. It, it does make sense to me. When, when I first read it, I thought, well, why would why would that be the case? Because all you'd have to do is search the property records and you would know who the owner is and, and who the lender is, but that may not be the case because you know people buy and sell notes all, all the time. So actually I do see value in, in, in that provision, and that's obviously not what's being set forth here. But where I do have a hard time is I think the language of this particular ordinance continues to place upon the burden of the lender enforcement actions and penalties for things that they don't have the ability legally to to do. And and I appreciate the spirit of the, the municipality and, and particularly the lawyer before you saying how it would really work. Um, but I, I'm just fearful that the language of the actual ordinance itself, the law, uh, in and of itself is, is not very clear on that subject. And so as such, I would say it, it, at best it, it's ambiguous. Of course, we, we as lawyers don't like that. Thanks. So, yeah. okay. Thank you. So I have a, a couple of questions. Ms. Alatel? Um, yes, thank you. So 
Is it your experience that during um, a foreclosure action that applicable state and federal law generally prohibits the lender from accessing the property? Absolutely. Okay. Um, and can I ask a follow-up question to this person? So, if that's the case, I guess I'm trying to see why we need to declare it. I mean, and I realize it's in the old code and we're kind of just adding this exception, but mm -hmm. it seems like it negates the entire purpose of Section B. Um, I see the purpose of the list and to get yeah. the lender information, but to say that they're owners when in fact they can't do anything with regard to the property, and as soon as that ownership would have changed in a foreclosure, they would have come off the registry, I'm wondering what's the purpose of Section B at that point, practically speaking. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that it's not true necessarily true that they always cannot access the property until the property until the foreclosure is complete. And I think it's when the property, like, there is a transfer of possession during the process. And you see, as you see, evidence, in the, you know, the, the stories we talked about was uh, at that point, that property uh, in the Mountain View, which was vacant, uh, was being maintained by Wells Fargo. Uh, even though it was still in the foreclosure process. Like they were coming out and putting up the boards. They had a, con a contract team in place that does that. Um, and so there, I, I agree that there are some, that before possession and before the bank has possession and is able to do that kind of maintenance, then they should not, um, I think that we're trying to do get out there is that they can't actually do anything specifically about those kinds of obligations before that point, but that that point often happens before, maybe again, some of the lenders and audience can speak to that, when they're able to possess, when they actually have possession and can do that kind of maintenance that you saw the bank doing in that story. Can you address that? Yeah, so the bank, the bank is obviously, uh, the lender is obviously uh, guilty, right? Uh, the, you know, plan banker, so. Uh, you know, the goal, of course, is to preserve the value of the collateral so that when there is the change of ownership interest, then at that point, there would be the maximum value uh, to try to get back, if you will, as much capital as possible. Uh, but the problem many times is that you, know, you work your way through the process. You have a, a you know, loan uh, that is not performing, people can't pay, and this is not just humans, it's businesses as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, there are many remedies that are available uh, for uh, lenders, uh, including non-judicial uh, uh, transfer through, you know, through the trustee sale. And so there's a process where you go through to see what's the best process to try to get as much uh, value out of the property. And it's those situations where you have uh, an owner who is in possession and is fighting you actively in the foreclosure process. That does not mean that they're not creating waste on the property. And many times that is in fact what's happening. But uh, at that point, if someone's in possession of the property, you're not going to go in and you know try to clean things up or you know uh, put boards on the windows. And you know a lot of times that's where the, those fights happen. I need a little more clarity. The actual thing I'm trying to figure out, though, that Ms. McPherson mentioned is when is the transfer of possession and foreclosure process usually occurring versus when it's concluded? Is it is, Does it happen like halfway through, three quarters of the way through? Does it wait till conclusion? Can you speak to that based on your experience? I, yeah, I mean, it would be at the time there is actually a, a, a foreclosure uh, proceeding where the bank is in or the lender is in possession of the property. Is that the is that at the conclusion of the foreclosure proceeding then usually? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, if, if I think our analysis was closer to that the deed of trust or the, the mortgage document is what uh, sets these rules for the state and federal law, and then most deed of trust documents do provide lenders with the right of possession on certain defaults, and so you do find some banks going in. Uh, I don't think it's sort of when properties have people in there. So like for an abandoned property that they do have, they do come in and board those properties up immediately, which you know confirms that these deed of trust documents, which provide for certain access, um, uh, do allow banks in, or excuse me, lenders, um, uh, free foreclosure. Free, because that foreclosure is when title formally changes often to a third party, not even back to the lender. But that there's this interim period where there are not uh, people in possession, um, uh, where banks can't do have access, lenders do have access. Speaking of much more nuanced version of what I was trying to say. Okay. 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 Okay.
Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I would, I would argue in, in that particular circumstance that you're not going to find a lender that's going to allow a property to become abandoned or it's going to be a nuisance property because they're trying to preserve the value of the collateral as best they can. And, and if you have evidence for that, uh, I would be surprised. Thank you. Mr. Dyson. Yeah. Um, quick things. Um, we want to do better. And if there's a better way for us to notify your industry when we have something coming up that <clears throat> you've got skin in the game. Uh, but but it indeed is for your association you know, to have somebody kind of watching what's going on or some kind of alarm system for yourself. You know, because we want all the stakeholders to have input. Uh, and yes, we're just modifying and apparently making February action better, but if you and your association know for a better way for the city to handle this kind of problems, you know, or flaws in the, what we passed in February, we're open to doing it better and fixing it and uh, so on. But the do nothing option on the abandoned property and the nuisance and the impact and stuff, we can't we can't do nothing. What has been happening with abandoned property is just unacceptable. So we need help. We want to fix the problem without uh, being unfair to the lenders. You know. So help us help you, please. Jeremy, I, may I address that? Sure. So I appreciate that. So the Bankers Association, we do have a full-time lobbyist, and so uh, that's seven financial institutions within the state of Alaska, and so we focus generally on those issues that are statewide. Uh, this obviously happens to be a municipal thing, so uh, it fell through the cracks, and as such, uh, we will obviously go forward monitor the actions of this body to make sure that we're well aware. Uh, it would have been nice if there would have been some communication with, um, you know, with the lenders uh, saying that this, this was in the queue, so we've been asking it, but on the front end of it, that obviously didn't happen, um, so that's fine. And I guess what I would just say, you know, my general thoughts on the subjects are, uh, you know, if there's a situation where uh, a lender, particularly a bank, uh, you know, uh, could in any way uh, maintain the property to preserve value, just the general marketplace will, I mean, that's what really actually happens, right? Uh, kind of depends upon various things of rights within documents that, that we have and in the context of the state of federal law, it's really the state law. But it's also the case that I believe that this particular ordinance, the original ordinance, uh, places uh, burden and liability uh, on folks that don't have the ability uh, to do anything about it. And so if you want to tax us, hey, we get taxed all the time by lots of folks. Uh, that's the easy thing that we do, right? We, get, we, we pay taxes all the time. Um, but to hold us responsible and hold us liable for an action that we can't possibly do uh, just seemed wrong to me and, and seems uh, you know, disingenuous. To okay, and tell us how to fix it. I, I do think that the notice Not provision... Not now. I do see value in the notice provision. I don't see uh, value in this this piece that's before you could ask. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sure. Go ahead. Okay, just a quick clarification. I think that's exactly what we're doing here because honestly what we try to do with this language in V especially is to provide that where you can't do anything, you don't have to. But as we talked about, when you do have possession, I think our experience might differ. I think our code enforcement team is seeing instances, not necessarily from your bank, but from other lender institutions, where they have the ability to enter the property, which they received uh, immediately um, uh, because, and uh, because property is involved. And the property is in the pendency of foreclosure, and they're boarding it up, but they're not. They're only kind of paying attention. So it's the boards are coming down three times a week, and we've got people, and they're engaging in criminal activity. And so, uh, where the bank is, or the lender is completely on top of the game, then great. This doesn't affect them at all. And where you can enter the property, our our vision with this language was to create that carve out. And if I agree with you that it doesn't provide this the specificity that I did. Uh, provide there, but our code generally doesn't. You know, who Jack calls when he sees a problem at the property is generally not codified. We can talk about whether or not there are specifics that this body would like to see, but our intent here was to create a carve out such that institutions that 
where you have someone who's still on the property and you cannot legally enter the property, then you can't, you clearly can't board it up and you can't physically take care of them out. You know, as a real estate lawyer, I know that you can't just, you know, however in default someone is, you cannot physically voice them off the property. And we're not intending to do that. So our intent is to do what it sounds like your testimony is, is talking about, is to create a carve out where it says, if you can't get on there, then we can't find you for that offense. But if you can, then you need to be boarding and securing, and we need to have someone to call to have you do that. And if you don't do it, then you're liable in the same respect that anyone else who controls the property is liable. You could be fined or you could get fees um, because someone has to be accountable for boarding up those properties and making sure that we aren't seeing somebody in there, um, making sure that the value of the property isn't destroyed as well. But So our intent, I think, is to do what you're, what you're asking for. And if we have not done it clearly enough, then I welcome suggestions for how to clarify uh, that portion of the language, and for your team as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, I uh, might have time for one more person to speak on this. Can, can we both maybe just take a couple of Sure, really quick. So, I'm Jan Yagashima, I'm Director of Mortgage Operations at Alaska Housing, and I think one of the first things everybody needs to understand is the lender is not the servicer. So your loan that you did with residential mortgage might be with Wells Fargo, it might be with North Rim, it might be with Black Knight Servicing. Black Knight Servicing is not a lender, but they service more loans than any other private servicer in the country. So you're talking about lenders in here, and Mike brought up you know, bankers, lenders, servicers. It's the servicers that are filing, that, that, are, that are servicing these loans that then send them notice of defaults that do all service these loans for investors, Alaska Housing, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, VA. So there are terms in here, lenders, when you talk lenders, the lenders don't have anything else to do with the loan once it's the loan is done and it's gone to the servicer of the loan. And so it's actually the servicer that does that. I want to adjust one thing that someone asked earlier about the properties. So within our portfolio of 16,000 loans at Alaska Housing, uh, our default rate, our delinquency rate is about 4.1. Our foreclosure rate is about 0.3%. So as you can see, most of those don't go. Of the loans that actually get a notice of default filed, which means the loan is delinquent by 120 days, generally at least. Of those, um, only 34% actually go to foreclosure. And of the 34% that go to foreclosure, 50% of them are still occupied at time of foreclosure. I just want to share those numbers. And I sent everyone a letter that gave you those numbers. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get the other person and I'll give it to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Darcy Schaefer. I'm with First National Bank of Alaska. I run the foreclosure department. A um, couple of things just to follow up on what Mike and Jan said. I, I really think this process could have been improved greatly by including our local community partners, like the local banks and credit units. Um, I think we have a lot of valuable boots on the ground inside. Um, I think that this registry is duplicative with, uh, with the vacant property registration because we really do not have property owner rights when we start foreclosure. So, um, you know, and probably, I was just sitting here calculating in my head, I think probably about 90% of our foreclosures when we initiate foreclosures are occupied properties. So. This really is heavy handed to property owners who are trying to save their homes or just adding additional costs that they have to pay to try and get out of foreclosure. Um, you know, we do, it is our goal to, even though we process foreclosures, we do try to help people, you know, stay in their homes in our community. So I think this adds additional fees that, you know, they're already trying to get money to, to reinstate their loan. This adds an additional fee. And we already, in, in Shelly, I think you same thing from the last PSA, we already take action on vacant abandoned properties. You know, if we have notification that is vacant, we go in, we change the locks, we transfer utilities, we monitor with regular inspections. We're already doing that. And so this is just adding 
you know, to me, duplicate effort and fees that are unnecessary to um, not just lenders, but the homeowners. We're, we're burdening the homeowners with additional fees. Um, and as to the question, time, uh, question about the timeline as far as ownership and the, in the foreclosure process, there's some milestones. What Jan was saying is the notice of default, that's the official notice that's required or that's recorded when the foreclosure action starts. It's the official record. The ownership transfer is either at the end of the foreclosure when the trustees see this was recorded. So at that point, if they can't cure the default or foreclosure takes place, the trustees deed is what transfers ownership to either back to the lender or to a third party who requires the property. So those are kind of the milestones as far as the time frame goes. So during the foreclosure process, if we have an uh, occupied property, we really can't do anything. I mean, we can't go in and, and start mowing along and picking up the garbage. Um, it's not our property. And we shouldn't, as lenders, be held to that standard as a property owner. Thank you. Thank you. So we're running behind schedule. So I just have time for two comments. So Mr. Wellington and then Mr. Peterson. Question to Jan or any of you. So um, that's an interesting point. So you may be the lender, but you're not the servicer. Do you have any influence over the servicer, though? So if you know, someone calls you and says, hey, you know, the property's in, I'll jump in, the water's in there. You can call the servicer and say, hey, deal with it. Or can, the, can you We as the investor, and we have been called by the municipality before, as the investor, we call our servicing partners and say, hey, we're hearing about this primrose property, there's all kinds of drug activity, that type of thing. And we we work with them together to say, what do we do with this? The, the municipality needs help, we need help. We can't keep the people out of this property, but we as the investor. So remember, the servicers are following the rules of the investor that they're servicing that loan for. The lender, the lender is out once the loan is moved on to servicing. So the lender was residential mortgage or any other mortgage company doesn't mean, so Alaska U Alaska housing's loans, um, we, our loans are done by, we have lending partners out there. They do the loan, it doesn't mean it's serviced by that lender. So residential does a loan or even uh, any, any financial institution. So Alaska USA could say, we're gonna sell that loan, the servicing for that loan that we did to, to First National. Anybody can sell their servicing rights to anyone. Does that make sense? Did I answer that? Yeah, I've seen it. Um, somebody, I was on the board of Credit Union One, but we held on to all our loans at that point. Right. So we didn't right. a whole lot of it. But, but, but I guess the point do. is, can they, I mean, once, the, so you're the lender, whoever they're defaulting on, I mean, we get that information. If we call them, does that lead quickly to someone who does have some influence, or is it just their If you call the lender, the mortgagee that's listed on the deed of trust, um, that mortgagee might be able to tell you who they sold it to the first time it got sold, or who the servicing is being done by, but that's it. You got a complicated business. It is, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Could you explain to me what a servicer is? I mean, is this a real estate company? Is this the company that does the closing documents? A title company? Who, who's the servicer? So after a loan is purchased, so uh, again, I, I keep using the same names, but so Alaska, let's say Alaska USA does a loan, and they, when they did their financing, the best rate that they could get was through Quicken. So they close <coughs> that loan, it's closed at a title company, and then the loan goes to the servicer. And the servicer might be Quicken if Quicken disservices their own loans. Or Quicken could say, we want Black Knight Servicing to handle our servicing. And so there's a lot of different setups. It could be a sub-servicing where Black Knight still looks like the servicer, but they're actually having First National do it for them. Uh, so it is a very complicated of who is actually so who, who is actually in charge of that servicing? And you're gonna be able to easily tell when you get a notice of default filed on an Alaska housing loan, you can pick up the phone and call us and we'd say, okay, we'll get in touch with our servicer because we know who's servicing our loans. But well, if it's- And a, my name is on the notice of default. I mean, my name and phone number is right there on the notice of default. 
with the same thing. Yeah. So I mean, you know, back to what they said originally, <coughs> this arose because of problems with out of state banks, not the local community. Out of state service. Yeah, out of state service, sorry. Yeah. The servicer really is the one who manages the loan, right? We collect the payments, we send out billing statements, we do the escrow, tax, <coughs> and that kind of I mean that's what the servicer provides. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, so if you guys have any amendments, please get those in ASAP and then we will have public hearing on this item on Tuesday.